Welcome to Resilience Unraveled. Hi everybody and welcome to Resilience Unraveled, a podcast that examines all aspects of personal and organisational resilience. A huge all-encompassing subject that covers the ability to thrive in life by harnessing your cognitive, emotional, physiological and contextual abilities. I share stories from people who have thrived despite remarkable obstacles, as well as highly successful practitioners and experts across a range of topics. And this podcast introduces their amazing stories and expertise, as well as my own reflections, perspectives, strategies and tips, which come from my own synthesis of themes and trends from wider learning. You can go to qedod.com forward slash extras to access offers, tools and resources, including free articles and eBooks. For those of you that would be interested in supporting our work and contributing more proactively, you can find our new Patreon page at patreon.com. Then search for Resilience Space Unraveled. So, let's get started. Enjoy the show. So today I'm talking to Marsha Moran about a, a really important subject, something that I'm actually really... Um, affected by myself within my own family and and friends and uh, I'm really delighted that Marsha's agreed to come and talk to us about the subject of strokes. So good afternoon Marsha. Good afternoon Russell, how are you today? I'm very good actually and uh, thoroughly enjoying the lockdown at the moment and uh, having a lovely time uh, (laughs) sitting chatting to people on Zoom Uh, but I can tell by your accent you're not in the UK so which part of the galaxy are you in? I live in Virginia. Right. And yeah. Now is that now there's more than one Virginia in the States, isn't there? So is that is that is there a, um, a specific bit? So I'm right out of Washington, DC. So oh, right. I'm at the epicenter of the US. Right. Okay. Oh well fantastic. Well tell me tell me how you describe what it is you're doing at the moment. So I am actually doing anything I can to promote my book because I had a stroke six years ago. And although I tried to find a job, I had aphasia. So I decided if I can't find a job, I'm going to write a book. (laughs) Right. So, 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 so tell us about that then a little bit. Tell us about what it's like to start having a, well, for, for, let me ask a better question. What was it like before you'd had a stroke? Was there any indication that this was likely to happen? Not really. So I was 53 and I was in good health. I ran three or four times a week. Right. I had low cholesterol. So I didn't really expect to have a stroke. And in fact, the day I had it, I didn't even figure out that it was a stroke until somebody actually told me. Right. So, so what actually happened then? So when I woke up in the morning, I felt odd. And so I reached over for my phone and texted a friend because I was supposed to meet her for breakfast. And I looked at my phone and I couldn't read the text. And I thought, that's weird. So I put the phone down, I rolled over, and I had the most immediate headache strike. Right. And despite the pain, I fell asleep. Right. And the next time I woke up, I knew I had real trouble because my entire right side was paralyzed. Wow. And so I knew that I either had to get up and get help, or I just needed to say, okay, this is it. So I rolled off the bed and I put my hand on the carpet and I dragged myself to the door. And the bedroom door was closed, so I reached up for the handle. And it took a while, but it finally snuck open. And I was so tired by that point, I took a break. Wow. And I don't know how long the break was for, but I finally dragged myself down the hall. Right. And I finally just totally ran out of gas. I knew my husband would come up sometime for a soda. 
And I don't know what happened, but suddenly there was a crash. Right. And my husband came upstairs and he saw me and said, Marsha, are you okay? And that's the point I realized I couldn't speak. Yeah. And he said, can you talk to me? And of course I couldn't speak, so the, it was no. And so he said, I'm going to call 911. Yeah. And I nodded yes. Yeah. So it took the paramedics only a few minutes to get here. And like I said, when they walked through the door, the first thing they said was, when did she have her stroke? Right. Yeah. And so that was, in a sense, that was the first time you knew what had happened. Exactly. And, and I mean, hearing those words must have been, I mean, pretty shocking, to say the least. I mean, I know you're in a physical state, but I mean, to hear almost that diagnosis must be pretty horrible. So how, how, how was that? Um, so I remember being kind of numb to stuff like that, but my husband was completely flabbergasted. Yeah. And so I actually lost consciousness on the way to the hospital. Right. The next thing I remember is somebody had dressed me in a hospital gown. I had a needle in my arm and my husband was there. Right. And... I felt that everything was going to be okay because he was there. Yeah. No. And so, and so obviously you, you, you obviously are treated in hospital and then at some stage you return to, um, well, you leave hospital, but that's not where, that's not where the treatment ends, I suppose, is it? No. So the treatment is, many layered. So there's treatment in the hospital. Yeah. I had two weeks of treatment in the rehab hospital. Right. I had six weeks of treatment at home. And then after that, there was a two week break. And then I had uh, probably two months of treatment in outpatient therapy. And after that, I had a physical therapist that I hired and she worked with me for a year. But now we're talking about physical getting. So my physical demeanor was about what it is now after a year and a half. Right. But I couldn't speak well for three and a half years. Right. And that's really interesting because I think there are two doctors that I would say helped me. So one gave me laser therapy right. at two years after my stroke. And one gave me neurofeedback at three and a half years after my stroke. Right. And combined, those two things helped me talk like I do now. Right. Okay, so let's, so, so I mean, that's a brilliant summary. So let's, let's start at the beginning, if you don't mind then. So for people that don't know, sure. what, what is a stroke? So... It's when you have a blood clot go to your brain yeah. and stop, their, um, stop the flow. Now, 13% of people have a hemorrhagic stroke. So that's actually when your brain bleeds, but the other percent have blood clot. And my blood clot was actually formed in my carotid artery. Right. And um, so I had a dissection there. And only 1% to 2% of people actually have that, and they don't know what causes it. Right. So, okay. So, I guess I'm just one of those three people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's good to be special. And uh, so a clot, a clot affects your brain or it blocks your brain or something. And then obviously there is yeah. effectively a new, uh, some form of damage in the brain. I mean, uh, yeah. what, what, what are the effects of that sort of damage in the short term? So I had a left-sided um, brain um, clot. And so my right side, like I said, was not um, paralyzed. Yeah. Now, I started getting some movement back, but I had severe pain for about two years. Right. And I couldn't walk very well. So that's why I had all that physical therapy, because it took me a long time to 
get back to walking like people who see me now don't think I've had a stroke. Right. Now, I do walk a bit off, but it's not all that visible. So, that, so that's very encouraging. The fact is that you can, with, with, an, with a huge amount of effort, get back to almost a pre-stroke phase. But isn't the secret to treating a stroke is to get treated as, or to get into hospital as soon as possible? Isn't that one of the secrets to that? Yeah. Yes, it is. So the longer you wait, the more damage you'll have. So you lose 1.9 million neurons for every minute that you're out of the hospital. Right. So get into the hospital as soon as you think you're having a stroke. And, and what's your message to people at the moment who might be worried about going to hospital because of the situation, either because there's, a, there's an outbreak or a virus or whatever else might be going on? Should they should they wait, or what would your advice be? No, they really need to get to the hospital because if they stay at home, it will just continue to get worse. And at the hospital, they're trained to keep you as safe as possible. Yeah, and to begin to treat as well, I suppose, immediately. Absolutely. Yeah, and if you're and if you're if you're living with someone and you and you think they have had a stroke, what are the sort of signs you should look out for? So, you actually look at their face. Yeah. So is one side drooping? You look at their arms and legs. So if one arm or leg doesn't move up like the other one does, yeah. you probably think they're having a stroke. Speech is also another factor if you're experiencing a slurred speech, yeah. you're likely having a stroke. And T stands for time to call 911, or in your case, I think it's 999. It is, yeah. Um, and yeah. Then, then God help us all how long that takes to work, but that's a different story. Um, and so basically you're, you're attempting to get to hospital as quickly as possible because there are drugs which are administered straight away, I'm guessing, to get rid of the block. Well, for some people, that's not really feasible. So if you're having a hemorrhagic stroke, they're probably not going to administer it. And... I didn't have it because there's a time limit for when you get it, and I was well past the time limit. Um, so that, so that, so the, the fact that you went to sleep was actually a negative yeah. thing in a, in a way. Was that was that is that the case? Well, I I think I probably had it while I was sleeping in the first place, right? And then I went to sleep on top of it, so they had no idea of when I had it. Right. Okay. Uh, fantastic, and 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 for most people who have strokes, what's what is the prognosis? What's the is is the outcome okay? I mean, what's the evidence in terms of treatment outcomes? So, ten percent of people actually are a hundred percent recoverable. Right, twenty five percent are mildly impaired, and that would be like me. Yes, forty percent have. Um, I'd say severe to moderate impairment. So it's more, they're more impaired than I am. Right. And 10% have to live in nursing homes. Wow. So it's a wide range. Yes. But the prognosis is actually, if you, if you get to hospital quickly, you, you really want to be in that up of 50% in a way, don't you? 50, 60%. So that, that's actually quite encouraging. So you decided to write a book and it's called Stroke Forward. What was the, what was the motivation for doing this? So my husband and I knew nothing about advocacy when I went into the hospital. Yeah. And when I came out, there wasn't anything available. And so I thought that I'd write a book because... If you're in a hospital and you don't know anything about stroke, that is the last time you want to learn about stroke, right? Yeah, it's a bit late, isn't it? It's like pregnancy, isn't it? Exactly. So, so here is a book that tells you the basics of what you need to know about advocacy. 
the thing I like about my book is that it tells you what it's like to go from my story, from me, but it also goes from telling the story from my husband's perspective. He was the caretaker, my family's perspective, friends' perspectives, and a couple of doctors. And I think it's really key because everyone views stroke differently. Right. Okay. And so, and so what sort of things are in the book? What sort of things do you cover? Well, okay. So I think that each chapter ends with a take action section. And right. for me, that's the advocacy. So, for example, accept help. When you're in early recovery, chances are that you need someone need to let someone bathe you, help dress you, and possibly assist you when going to the bathroom. Right. You may feel a bit uncomfortable, but those things need to be done. I understood how dependent I was on other people after my own stroke. Being independent, or I'm sorry, being dependent also made me want to get better. Right. So I would need their help. Freedom is a great motivator. So yes. that's just one piece of advice. And so when I talk about freedom, that means that I had to work out every single day. Yeah. And I didn't feel like it some days, but I still did it. Yeah. I mean, you're literally, in a sense, you're rewiring your brain in a way, aren't you? Or parts of your brain. Yeah. And people don't yeah. understand how important exercise is to that process, do they? they? They sort of think it has nothing to do with it. It's just about fitness. But it is actually about forcing the brain to work in a, in a, in a more aggressive, aggressive is the wrong word. It's about forcing the brain to work more skillfully, isn't it? Yes, it is. Right. Interesting. Um, okay, then. So you also talk about in the book that you've got a, no, a, a number of resources and um, what, so, were there, was there a shortage of resources when 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 this when you when you were looking for help afterwards? I'm not sure there was a shortage, but I couldn't find them. Right. So, I think it's a combination of things. So, there's a shortage to me because I couldn't find any. But also, I think there are books out there that are starting to talk about advocacy and what it means to people right. um so i had my stroke in 2014 and the only person i saw that had written anything was joel bolte taylor and she wrote my stroke of insight right. and i i thought it was fascinating reading about it um and i think that's kind of weird because so i read about it and then i forgot I read about it and I forgot. So yeah. it takes a while <laughs> for yeah. a person to really understand that you really can't remember anything, say, maybe five minutes after you read it or talk to somebody. It's really fascinating. Yes, I bet. Okay, fantastic. So where can we find your book? How, how can we find out more about your work? What, what can we do about that? So my book is available on Amazon, and you yeah. look for Stroke Forward. Yeah. And my website is strokeforward.com. That's strokeforward.com. Fantastic. And there's all sorts of interesting bits and pieces about um, strokes and um, such like. And, and I think you have a, an update and a newsletter and such like that is worth signing up to, I'm guessing? Yes. Exactly. Perfect. That's that's an amazing story. And so, and so, what's your message then to someone who's thinking about stroke, worried about stroke? What, what's the key? What are the key messages you want to leave people thinking about? So, if you have a stroke, you need to get into the hospital now. Right. And after you've had a stroke, my key message would be: you have to keep at it every single day. So you have to do those exercises, even though you may not want to sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> because those are the bits and pieces that actually make you better every day. 
You may not see it, but it's true. They will make you better. So it's almost a full-time job recovering. <laughs> it is. Wow. And, uh, you know, that's, that's quite sobering, isn't it? So actually, if you can't look after yourself, that's certainly incentive to make sure that we're all really clued up on how to spot yeah. somebody else having a stroke and, and maybe even just spotting the signs in ourselves. I mean, that's a really, that's really good, good advice. Well, you know, the thing that most, that made me the most curious is that we have strokes from neuronatal to 80s or 90s. There is no time in your life where you say, oh, I'm too young to have a stroke. I didn't think that, but it's true. Right. It's a sort of these, the hidden assassin in a way, isn't it? And it's, it's, um, I don't want to make people anxious about it, obviously, but it is something that we should bear in mind. And it is something in terms of our own self-care we should be thinking about. So I know you were in, in a good fit, you were in a state of good fitness at the time, but for a lot of people who have stro strokes, I'm guessing they have a lifestyle that might make them more susceptible to strokes. Yeah, I think so. So you need to be sure that you're not smoking, yeah. not drinking much, be in good health, so that means you have to look at what you're eating. Um, if you have diabetes, you have to be aware that you are in a risk factor for stroke. Yeah. Um, it's just the way it is. Yeah. But there are some things that you can do that will make you better. So if you exercise, you will decrease your chance of stroke. It seems a simple. It seems a um, a massive reward for a very simple thing to do, isn't it? it we, everybody's yes, it everything, everything. It's mental health through to uh, disease prevention, through to um, just general feelings of well-being, seem to be driven by exercise and eating well. So it is. It is, I think, something that yeah. we need to factor into our normal lives. Marsha, thank you so much for spending time with us. It's absolutely fascinating. And uh, I think that's a cautionary tale and something that's very useful. Again, you can get hold of Marsha Maran's story at strokeforward.com and her book is at amazon.com and amazon.co.uk as well. And uh, I recognize the read. And I shall certainly be boning up on my um, how to spot a stroke because I think it's one of the things I worry about. So uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Hi, everybody. I hope you found that episode useful and interesting. Feedback is always welcomed, and if you are in the mood to subscribe to us or even leave a comment on iTunes or Stitcher, that would be amazing. If you want to suggest ideas, or even people you would like me to interview, then reach out to us at qedod.com forward slash contact. As I said earlier, you can go to qedod.com forward slash podcast for show notes or follow the links. And you can go to qedod.com forward slash extras to access offers, tools and resources, including free articles and ebooks. For those of you that would be interested in supporting our work and contributing more proactively, you can find our new Patreon page at patreon.com. Then search for Resilience Unraveled. I look forward to being in your ear next time around. Take care.